Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Courtney Bryan, the Executive Director of the Center for Court Innovation, and thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you who are less familiar with the Center, we are an organization on a mission to create a fair, effective, and humane justice system. We help to prevent people from going into the system in the first place, reduce incarceration, um, and address underlying needs, repair harm, and strengthen neighborhoods. And we're a unique institution in a few ways. First, we're both thinkers and doers. We learn by doing, by running on the ground programs that serve people in communities and in courthouses, by conducting research to help policymakers and practitioners understand the problems that we face and offer solutions, and by sharing what we learn in practice and in study with others around the world. Second, we're both insiders and outsiders working collaboratively with both government and with advocates and the community to shrink the footprint of the legal system and push actors in new and positive directions. Let's turn to today. We're all here, hundreds of us, to learn about restorative justice, about the promise and possibilities it offers. On a daily basis, we see a nation plagued by bigotry and violence and pain. We're here because we seek a new way forward to help heal and repair to connect, to support, and to hold ourselves and the systems we create and participate in accountable to one another. Restorative justice is one path. At the center, we've seen restorative justice respond to harm between strangers, between family members. We've seen restorative justices, restorative practices shift culture and discipline in high schools. And we've used these practices to help people process the trauma of arrest and incarceration. Importantly, all of our work, in all of our work, we've been guided by the wisdom of Native American elders and practitioners. I wanna acknowledge that the land we are all on today, wherever we are, belonged to the First Nations first. I encourage you to find out who originally inhabited your land and we can put in the chat how to do that. I'd like to now pass it over to Ray Deal a retired peacemaker of the Navajo Nation and one of the center's primary teachers in this work to open our event with a traditional ceremony. Ray. I'd just like to say uh, good morning to everybody. And I'm really honored to uh, be given this uh, time to uh, open up for all the panelists. And uh, in our ways, uh, the most natives and us uh, Navajo, or we call ourselves Dene, we understand that a lot of our prayers are written in our songs. So that's what I want to start out with uh, today uh, to, to sing a song about uh, rejoicing about our life, our wanting to move forward. This song is an expression of uh, 
walking on a daily basis in beauty. Beauty is a, a thing that uh, is impressed upon the blessing away ceremony of the Dine. And we understand it is before us, it's behind us, below us, above us, all around us. And beauty should also flow from our uh, speech, from our utterance. And so that way, when you talk nice, positive, good to others, then you be treated the same way. And that's the way that expression goes to the creator to, to uh, renew ourselves with uh, our presentation and to move forward. So I want to say thank you for listening and the, the creator be with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, I have been honored to call you grandfather these many years. And I am really, really happy to have you open us today and always so grateful for you, um, for your presence in my life and in these moments. Um, yeah, your songs have um, accompanied many of us here in New York for a long time. So we're really thankful to you. Thank you, Courtney, for giving us the mic today to talk to about, about restorative justice. My name is Erica Sasson. Um, I direct our restorative practices here at the center. Um, I just wanna give another moment for everyone to just take in that song. Um, so if you wanna just take that in for a second. Um, I'd just like to welcome you all here and to welcome our guests. We have um, Ray, who you just heard from, who's a retired peacemaker and who's come to New York many times to um, teach us about a different way. Um, and he does it uh, in his way. Um, we also have Kay Pranis here, uh, who's a teacher and a dear friend uh, living in Minnesota, uh, a trainer and an author. We have Dave Rash, uh, the retired chief judge of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans Tribal Court. And we have Cheryl Graves, I'm looking for Cheryl. Um, who is the co-founder and executive director of Community Justice uh, for, Youth in, uh, for Youth Institute out of Chicago. So we have this great group of people together here today and we have all of you. Um, and there are so, so many of you. Thank you all for joining us today. I, I'd love to see um, who's in the room. So um, feel free to throw in the chat where you are, um, your name and just where you are so we can kind of see the chat explode uh, with the diversity. Um, and yes, keep sending your love to Ray. Uh, Ray, the, the chat's going wild right now with thanks and gratitude. Um, so ordinarily, I, again, I would prefer to be in a little bit of a more intimate space with you all, but it is really uh, something incredible to, uh, to be with so many of you and to be able to um, share this virtual room with people um, from all over. Wow, there's, there's just tons of people. Wonderful. I'm in Brooklyn, so I'll share that. Uh, and it's incredible to see how far and wide everybody is. So I'm going to take a few minutes to just explain where we, um, what we're going to be doing with our time together. We have about an hour and a quarter um, in which we'll share this space together. And I want to um, just explain how we're going to do that. So first, I'll be laying some of the foundation for how and why we use um, restorative justice and how we've learned about peacemaking and incorporated it into our work. Um, then. Uh, and, and again, I, we don't speak for the whole restorative justice movement. We certainly don't speak for um, the peacemaking traditions of this country. We are just sharing how we do this in our own way and what we've learned and what we've brought to the fore. Um, then we're gonna bring our guests into the conversation. I'm gonna be asking them questions to, uh, related to restorative justice and peacemaking um, in this moment. So, uh, and we'll, we'll use a circle type of format. And during this portion, it's about 20 to 30 minutes. I'm gonna ask that we disable the chat and I'm going to invite you to disable all the browsers and the notifications and the pings um, in your life, the news uh, updates right now. We're just gonna try to disable all of that so we can sit together and I'm inviting you to sit with us 
Um, I know everyone has a lot going on in their life um, and uh, maybe we could have a bit of quiet time together to reflect on where we've been. Um, then I'm gonna ask some of the practitioners of this work at the Center for Court Innovation, some of our newer folks to join us and ask questions directly of the panelists and our guests. And then we will um, do a short Q and A. We will close with a poem um, by my colleague, the inimitable Erica Wright. Um, and so that will be a great way to close. Um, and so now just for how we come to this work at the Center for Court Innovation, I feel really lucky to have been working um, in my little corner of the world, thinking about how these approaches can help us move forward from, uh, from harm. And I'm gonna be discussing both peacemaking and restorative justice. I learned peacemaking from Ray, from Dave, from Mike Jackson and Cake, um, from the Honorable Barb Smith, from the Chickasaw Nation who passed away, who we miss. There, there are just these incredible people um, around the country who have shared the lessons of peacemaking. I don't wanna collapse that into the work of restorative justice, which is a framework that I've learned um, through the literature and through relationships with people like Kay and Cheryl. Um, these are not collapsible identities, but um, I do wanna highlight the importance of what our um, indigenous teachers have taught us um, over a long period of time and how we have grown from that in the restorative justice movement. Um, in the last years at the Center for Court Innovation. So this is just a little bit about our work and, and how we've tried to use the ideas um, that we've learned. So for one, we've created community-based peacemaking programs. We've done that in Syracuse and Red Hook, Brooklyn, um, where community residents are trained by native peacemakers, including by Ray and by Dave and many others, um, about how to use this approach to resolve harms to, those can be um, cases from the local courts or very often cases that come up and, and conflicts between neighbors and family members that come up in the community. Um, we've also worked in schools, as Courtney mentioned, uh, trying to use the circle process to build positive culture in the school and, and allow students to share their real concerns so that we can get to the real issues that are fueling, um, acting out or other behaviors. Um, we are trying in those cases to reduce the use of exclusionary discipline like suspensions and expulsions. Um, but we're also trying to address, and I wanna say this specifically for New York City, we wanna address the racial inequities that we have in our school system. And that is really, that's a topic for a whole other webinar, which I would be really happy to do um, because as any parent of a public school child, it's, it's a really, um, it's, a, it's the, maybe one of the pressing issues of our time. Um, we've also been looking at how community-based restorative approaches can uh, address and makes, um, create new pathways for the crisis of intimate partner violence in our families and communities, which is pervasive, which is um, getting, it feels getting worse uh, through this pandemic um, and requires all of us to create new norms. Uh, around how we protect our most vulnerable family members. Um, and we also wanna do that, especially for people who are looking uh, to avail themselves, not of the legal system, but of another way to stop the harm in their lives. We've been also working in alternatives to incarceration, thinking about how to create safe alternative processes for people facing very serious harm, um, including homicide most recently. I've personally witnessed how these, these approaches have given people a different voice. I've seen people um, come into a process in conflict and leave using the same transportation, going home in the same car together after having had the time and the space to air their grievances and move forward and find their own ways to move forward. Um, and you know, if, if restorative justice has been effective in your community, uh, I see Judge Calabrese there. I'm so happy to see you. Thanks for that chat. If it's been effective for you, please put it in the chat. We want to know, um, you know, who's who has been touched by this work, uh, and I really want to see this chat pop. So, um, share how it's been effective for you. I've been really, really buoyed. I've been buoyed by the network of supportive practitioners across this country who I can call at the drop of a hat to say, I have this case, I have this problem. Um, I have these people who are sharing this level of harm in their life. Um, and uh, please tell me, you know, how I can create a container for them so that they can come to a better um, position moving forward.
but I want to just pivot real um, to, to why we're here today at this day, at this time with these people talking about restorative justice and peacemaking. Um, there's always uh, time for a how to do something, but we're going to do something a little different today. And I want to just spend a minute acknowledging this moment we are in together um, and this year that we have had. Um, this has been a year of grief. There has just been um, so much grieving uh, across um, so many levels of our lives, whether it's the lost time and the lost opportunities, um, whether it's being separated from loved ones, the lost adventures, the lost gatherings. Um, we have been grieving the loss of personal, of physical touch. We have been grieving the inability to share food together. These are all things that are so connected to peacemaking and restorative justice. Um, and the most devastating is that we have just been in an eternal grief for all of the missing members of our communities and our families and our society. And so just saying a moment for everybody who is not um, here with us today. And we do so without the rituals that we need, the grief rituals and the birth rituals that support us um, when we go through life stages um, shifts. And we've also done so, um, just again, another, maybe just another breath in and out for all of the people that we've lost. And we have um, done so in um, an election year with an unprecedented level of instability, anger and distrust. And that has been really hard. Um, we don't have the collective norms that we maybe took for granted, even around basic issues such as health and how to protect one another's health. Um, it seems we are paying the price for a toxic individualism and that we are certainly paying the price for an unwillingness to name, uh, address and remedy the massive historical harms of the past and the present. And amidst all of that very dire backdrop, um, there is joy. There is joy in being gathered with Kay and Cheryl and Dave. There is joy in um, living with less sometimes, um, doing less, maybe not for the working parents out there, but um, we are living with less and there's joy in that. There's joy in the reflective space that we've had and some of the quiet that we've had. Um, there's the joy that New York City was overtaken by birds in the spring which is very beautiful. Um, and there was joy in all of the civic participation that brought so much hope for the future. And so I hope that we can hold the grief and the joy um, and all of the unnamed pieces in between as we have our conversation. And this is the last piece that I wanna just add. I know every, everybody in this call, and there's you know, 500 of you right now, a lot of people need urgent solutions to incredible quagmires. And there is this promise of restorative justice and a lot of, um, wishfulness for a how-to and a guide for how to do this through a PowerPoint presentation um, and a toolkit. I don't have any of those for you today, but what we're going to do instead is just spend some time together. Um, and this is how, how we do in restorative justice. We spend time naming and acknowledging what is happening, and we hope that that time is well spent so that people um, have the space to reflect and come up to their own solutions for how to move forward. So it's a, we're gonna learn by doing. I hope that that um, works for everybody. I'm gonna um, disable the chat right now. Thank you. I hope we can um, have it accessible to us afterwards. Um, and I'm going to welcome our guests, ask you all to unmute. And I will give the, the order um, if we can go, um, Kay, Cheryl, Dave, and then maybe we'll switch orders for the next question. Is that um, good for my panelists? And so I'll pass it to you, Kay, um, to introduce yourself and just share something about how peacemaking and restorative justice has shaped your life. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, I'm Kay Pranis. I live in Minnesota and it's snowing, <laughs> which I love. I think you're crazy to live in Minnesota you don't. <laughs> Um, what it's meant in my life. Um, as a young adult, I decided that the purpose of life was to love and be loved. 
and and I understood that in the context of family and close personal associates. And I stayed home for 16 years raising my kids. And then I accidentally ended up in this work and discovered that I could take that purpose to another level. And that, that circle in particular was a space where I could find love for everyone who was in that space. Even though we might differ enormously uh, in all kinds of ways, I could always find something in the human being that I could love. Um, so this work has brought meaning and purpose to my life that I didn't know was possible. I didn't know it was possible for, for a human to experience um, love at that scale. It, it was a way to take love to a scale of of community and collective that that I didn't know was possible. And the the other thing I think about in terms of you know what it's meant in my life is that sitting in circles so much has taught me so much about human nature that is hopeful. Um, that and in that and in the teachings I got from indigenous people. Uh, this work brought me a new understanding of the nature of the universe and the nature of human beings that for me uh, holds so much hopeful potential for who we can be and, and how we can uh, live well together. And that that learning is ongoing and, and actually accelerating <laughs> and, and I'm over 70, but I'm like, Oh dear, there's still so much to learn. Can I live long enough to learn all the things that I need to learn from, um, uh, from the universe itself, from other human beings, from the plants and the animals, from the rocks uh, and the waters. And so, so this work for me is, is about how to, to live together well, but not just as human beings, but in, in relationship with all of the other parts of creation. So thank you. And I'll pass to Cheryl. So I really appreciate just having the opportunity to talk to so many people. Um, I have to say, I mean, this isn't when we talk about the pandemic and all, but it really has affected me quite a bit. And because I'm so used to sitting with lots of people all the time and sometimes small groups, but still a lot of small groups. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm look, I've been looking forward to this. So thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I am a child of the South Side of Chicago. I was born and raised here. I live in the same house I grew up in, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I have to say that I bumped into restorative justice and thank God for Kay Prannis. That's all I have to say, <laughs> because she certainly was a teacher was and is a teacher, a mentor, a friend, a comrade, and all of that. Um, I also have to say, though, that my work that preceded coming to restorative justice and learning about it really did prepare me well. Um, living in the same community all my life, most of my life, really taught me the power of community. Um, and even, and actually all the work I've ever done from community health education in Atlanta, where I was working with Spelman students, and we went out into communities to talk about, you know, the, the dangers of sexually transmitted diseases and how to address them. But if you were willing to sit and drink sweet tea or have some lemonade and sit on the porch first, nobody was trying to hear that. Um, I did disability rights work for um, about six or seven years as a lawyer. And the theme there, actually they coined the phrase, nothing about us without us, which meant you all may be lawyers or this, that, or the other, but we are the ones that have been impacted. And so we are the ones that you need to listen to. <laughs> and we did. And they were a powerful organizing force. I can remember when they sat in front of the, the CTA buses and they stopped traffic completely in their wheelchairs and did not move for hours, 12 hours because the buses weren't accessible. And that was a long time ago and people don't, rem don't remember, but that was so powerful. But to work with those folks and really to know that, just shut up and listen, <laughs> you know? Yes, your ideas matter, but you're not 
We're not working on this for you. And so I learned so much about listening. I also learned a lot about problem solving, that it's not about can you win or lose, it's what are the concerns that people have and how do those problems get solved? And very often, my role as a lawyer and even as an RJ practitioner has been just shut up and listen. The best lesson I ever learned was from a woman who has now made her transition. And I was at a community meeting and I was at, at Northwestern Law School at the time. And we had this great idea for a victim offender conferencing model. And we had gone to the court and they said, yes, you can do it in this neighborhood. And we had it all set to go. And so I was invited to give a presentation at this community meeting. I sat down next to this woman and she said, now, who are you? And I told her who I wish, oh, your name is on this, on the agenda. She said, and what are you here for? She said, are you from Austin? I'm like, no. Where are you from on the west side? I'm not from the west side. I'm from the south side. Oh my God, you're from the south side. Um, and she said, so what are you here for? And I told her we had this idea to keep young people out of the system and da, 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 da. And everybody had agreed. She said, and who's everybody? I said, well, the courts have agreed. And she said, but did the community say we wanted it? And I was kind of taken aback, like, of course you would want this, right? I mean, this is going to keep you know, the children, the young people in the community out of the system and community people will be able to make these decisions and talk about the issues. And, and she said, let me tell you something, honey. She said, that's a real, that sounds really good to me. She said, but a couple of things. We got issues with food insecurity. We got issues with housing, health care. She said, you name it. She said, and yes, justice and juvenile justice is critical. She said, but you have to realize that you need to come to meetings when you're not on the agenda. You need to come to meetings just to get to know us and know what we care about and know what we need. She said, and then we'll really listen to you. She said, but since you talk so good right now, I'm going to introduce you to the people <laughs> you know, so they'll listen to you. Yeah. I spent days and hours in her basement. The aldermen would come. The gang members would come. There would be, you know, she, she was... She was priceless. Her name was Shirley Jones. And I learned so much from her about just that. Shut up and listen and share what you have to share, but always being respectful. And one last thing, there was a word I learned. We, took, we did a restorative justice delegation to South Africa in 2010, and about 15 of us went. And spent a lot of time with a lot of different communities and learned a lot about restorative justice on the ground in Cape Town and the surrounding communities. And one of the things, one of the words I'll never forget is the word saubona. And it's a Zulu word that means I see you. And it's not just I see your physical presence, oh, you look good, right? It's I see you. I see your heart. I can see and feel what you care about. I can see what you're hiding. Most of all, I'm trying to sense and see your needs. And so let's talk about it, but let's really see each other. And I learned that while we were in South Africa, but that word I carry with me every day in my, in, even in my interactions with my family who I know really well, but I need to see them. And sometimes there are things that are hurting and bothering them that they can't even talk about. They don't quite have the words for. And certainly that happens with community. And so for me, restorative justice is all about us seeing each other. And, and I have to honestly say, even watching all the madness on TV, what happened in DC and what's happening around the country and what's been happening, part of my gut says, how do I see these people? You know, how do I understand at least enough to be able to think about what my role is in this or what our role is in this? Um, so anyway, um, that's enough. I'm gonna pass it on, I think, maybe back to Erica. No, we gotta hit, we're gonna hit Dave next. You Yay. can't get out of this, Dave. He already tried to, to skedaddle out of this once, but not twice. Dave, well, it's on you. <laughs> uh, the reason I like to go last is because uh, all the wisdom I have has been plagiarized. So I just stole some from Kay and I stole some from <laughs> Carol and uh, you've already added to my life. Uh, my name is Dave Rash. I'm an enrolled member of the Stockbridge-Munsee Band of Mohican Indians, uh, last of the Mohicans. 
uh, the remnants of our tribe, about 1,500 of us, uh, have a reservation in Wisconsin, about uh, 65 miles from where I live right now. The, uh, I was born and raised there uh, in, a, in a log shack that was, I believe, the, the cook house for a lumber company that clear cut our reservation. So we grew up very poor, uh, as did everybody else on the reservation at that time. Uh, in fact, we didn't know we were poor until we left the reservation and, and saw people with cars that had tires that matched and, and uh, all of that stuff. Uh, so I grew up very poor, I grew up, you know, pretty much in the woods and hunting and fishing and uh, doing a lot of work in the fields and, and so forth, which, you know, I hated at the time, uh, but uh, I sure value the lessons I learned uh, from that. Now, getting involved in restorative justice or peacemaking uh, it has really changed my life. And I started listening, as Cheryl said, um, you have to listen. Uh, when I became a judge, I questioned it in one of the trainings, <clears throat> why does everything you file in court, you file for a hearing on this, you file for a hearing on that, and you file for a hearing on this. We can all hear unless we're hearing impaired. But we file for these hearings and then nobody listens to us. So there's a difference. There's a difference between hearing you and listening to you. There's a sense of uh, uh, some sort of uh, comprehension of maybe a feeling that uh, uh, goes along with listening. And listening to my elders and especially to my, my aunt Dot, who was a big mentor of mine, a big change in my life came when she, she was, was telling me about human beingness. And if, if human being is two words, which it is, then human is an adjective describing a being. We're just a human spiritual being, as are the animals, the trees, the fish, all of nature, a spiritual being. Given some special free wills and that sort of thing, but we're just a special being. And then she goes on to describe about how we we could go walk. And I suppose you, you, you people in New York, you probably walk through Central Park. Uh, Kay probably walks through uh, the forest of Minnesota. And, and I was born and raised in the woods. But I never paid any attention to all the different things I saw in the woods until my aunt pointed it out. I mean, you walk in there and you see how many different colors of flowers and different shapes. And you see a squirrel running here and a chipmunk running there. And you see a, a crow fly from a tree and now maybe you'll see a, a bald eagle. And you'll see all kinds of different colored birds. And then she said, can you agree that all of those different things that we're seeing and that we're enjoying, and we think they're beautiful, can we agree that those were made by a power greater than us? And of course the answer is yes. And then she said, then <clears throat> all those differences that you see are sacred and they should be respected and not judged. And that changed my life a lot. And we're talking about, uh, the, the modern times, the today, the issues of today, those differences are sacred. I don't understand them sometimes, and maybe I don't agree with them. The things that happened here in the last uh, week or so has tested my, uh, my ability to say, you know, their action is sacred. I don't think their action is, but I think perhaps the human being part of them is out of balance. And I learned through the restorative justice and the peacemaking thing is that if I'm out of balance, I'm no good to the world. And last week it was really, really, really tough to stay in balance. I was over way over to the emotional side, the anger, anger side, uh, 
to the point where I probably not, may have been able to get physically uh, upset. But restorative justice has taught me about balance and how to rebalance myself. And I think if we use those techniques, we can do that with other people. But we have to have it ourselves in our heart. I think uh, as far as restorative justice goes, and, the, the, and we see the, the crimes being committed, and they're gonna continue to be committed unless we balance, rebalance those people, and rather than just punishing them. Uh, I think our greatest uh, protection of our women and children today, and perhaps uh, what happened last week, is finding a way through these practices to change their behavior, change the behavior of those that, that are, are, are violent or, or do bad things, to change their behavior rather than simply punishing the behavior for a period of time and not making much of an attempt to change it. And so that's really changed me. And I just want to finish with one quick story. Be, while I was a tribal judge, <clears throat> which was a part-time position, I was also uh, a clerk of a court system. And one day, <clears throat> a young native girl, maybe 13 years old, <clears throat> had to appear in court for a terrible crime of truancy. <clears throat> she walked into the courtroom, it's closed, uh, closed hearing because she was a juvenile. Her mother was with her. Her mother sits in the back row of the courtroom and lets her daughter approach the bench by herself, which should have been a clue to that judge. <clears throat> he says, young lady, you're charged with truancy. How do you plead? She says, I'm guilty, sir. He says, okay, I'll find you guilty. I'm imposing a fine of $90. You have 90 days to pay that fine. And if you don't pay it, your driver's license will be suspended for 90 days. When you're eligible to get one, have a nice day. That took approximately 11 seconds. That's how much time the judge spent in the life of that girl. When she came to get her paperwork, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Indian also. I said, in a school was one of the best times of my life. I mean, on reservation, we didn't have a running water or plumbing. The first shower I ever took was in school. First time I hit a baseball with something that said Louisville Slugger on it was at school. First time I shot a basketball through a hoop that had something beside binder twine on it. I said, school was a lot of fun. Why don't you go? Why don't you like it? She said, because every morning when I wake up, <clears throat> there's a different man with my mother and my friends tease me. And that has changed my life dramatically because the system I was working in was treating a victim as a defendant. And so when the restorative justice comes around, we get to talk about those things. We get to listen to her and not simply apply the laws that's written. And so it's been a dramatic impact on my life. Uh, I'm now retired, however, I'm still passionate about this. And I'm gonna pass this back to Erica. Thank you all. I'm going to also answer and just say that I think that, uh, you know, I am, I'm an attorney and I am used to the sound of my own voice and think that it has so many interesting things to say. And the process of stopping and listening has been incredibly transformative for me. And really just personally for me, sometimes I think I'm in it for myself to become a person who can actually sit in here and listen to other people, listen to other people. And I, again, I, I mentioned um, Barb Smith, Dave, and I feel like mentioning her again and how she came to Red Hook when we were early in the program and we were all concerned with the outcomes and whether we were gonna be able to demonstrate what we said we were trying to do when we were running the Red Hook Peacemaking Program. And she was like, I don't understand what these outcomes are that you're trying to prescribe. Like you're in the wrong line of work right now. Um, and, you know, you need to just uh, let go of that, create a positive space and just let people do what they need to do. And this isn't about you. And I was like, 
right? Uh oh. Um, and I feel like I've applied that for me personally to parenting, to step parenting. How do you just do the thing that you're trying to do and let go of the, the finale that you're trying to accomplish and kind of um, get some humility uh, in how you, how you run around the world? It's been really, really transformative. Um, now this group, as I knew I was planning this panel um, that you know we would get through, I have like five questions for this group and I know that we will all take our time to answer them as we see fit. Cheryl <laughs> laughing at me. Um, Cheryl, you, did you check your mic? Cause I think we need you to put your mic back in and reset, reset it. Um, so I'm gonna ask a compound question because that'll give you the chance to answer A or B and whatever you want. Um, and so the compound question is really about this pandemic and very specifically about Black Lives Matter. And I want you to just answer whatever it is that is urgent for you, but the pandemic has brought out certain truths um, about how we relate to one another uh, that I think has been incredibly, um, I want you to reflect on that. But then the second piece of this is um, the protest this summer around Black Lives Matter and um, the urgency in which people have said, we need a change. This is something that really plagues me in my work. People really wanna change and they're right, we need a change. And sometimes they say, oh, you've got this restorative justice. You know, can you make this situation better? Can you be the solution? Is this solu the solution? And I get really, um, concerned about the urgency and how do we meet this need for transformation that we have in our communities, um, but not rush it. Like, how do I take what Barb Smith taught me about outcomes and, you know, letting go of the outcomes when the inquiries are coming in, hey, do you have the solution to my problem? Um, how can restorative justice fix this mess that we are in? And so thinking about, again, the pandemic and the protests from the summer and the need for transformation, how do we meet this moment um, in a good way? Uh, and you guys can give me a sign of who wants to go first and then pass it. You got any volunteers? Okay, Cheryl. I guess I just wanted to share one of the things that we're doing in Chicago. Um, obviously the protests were, um, ongoing they still are ongoing to some extent um, to a large extent you know people have organized in all kinds of ways around it and so specifically as sort of justice practitioners um, and advocates we started to think of what's something that we could do that would be very definitive and so we decided to reach out to people throughout the city who were practitioners and what came back was why don't we reach out to the state's attorney, the city, the county, and the police and say, these cases for quote unquote protesting and looting, let those go through a restorative justice process. Um, we had, there were four organizations, mine included, but there were some 75 organizations, churches, I mean, the whole gambit, individuals, professors, folks from across the spectrum who signed on to it. And we actually had a meeting a week and a half ago with the head of the state's attorney's office, with the head of the Cook County Board. Um, we also have invited the police and we'd invited the city. Um, police and city, city showed up, didn't have much to say, but the state's attorney is totally on board, as is the county board and we can actually move ahead with just the two of them. So we decided that we only want felony level cases because the other matters are pretty much being diverted. But we, what we explained to them and what they understood, which was the best part, we've been talking to them for years, that they got it. And it was that if there's not, a, if there's not community engagement around this, um, both the communities where folks come from and the communities that were impacted, um, and also thinking about the quote unquote riots is, I think Dr. King said it is the language of the unheard. It's people speaking out and screaming out, you know, for justice and not just us. And so we're now in the process of beginning to get people organized who are going to be doing the hearing, doing the hearings, Lord, it's in my court voice, uh, doing our, the, 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 the circles, keeping the circle spaces. But we also, um, 
are identifying resources for folks, you know, who are clearly impacted by both the pandemic, but also just by the ongoing racism, the segregation, et cetera, in Chicago. So hopefully we'll have good news to share with you all when we actually begin to get those cases diverted from court and the commitment at this point on part of the state, the state and the county is that they are willing to send those cases out and that the other commitment that we asked them for was that yes, we want the cases out of the court system, but we also want you all, you, your staff, system folks, not necessarily to participate in these circles, but to really begin to participate in some healing spaces where community and systems folks and just other folks can begin to sit together and hear each other. So that's sort of what's happening and that's what's on our plate. So we will move forward and let you know what's going on. Uh, so I'm gonna follow up on uh what Cheryl's talking about with just a specific example and then speak more generally. Um, I was not a part of this situation. I only heard about it when it was entirely resolved, but a statue of Columbus was pulled down in front of our Capitol building this summer. And that uh, the person who had organized that was charged. The county attorney in Ramsey County, um, who had been expressing interest in restorative justice over a number of years, but hadn't found a way to sort of grab it and do something with it. Uh, out of his office, there was a, a decision to handle this case uh, using circle process in particular. And in early December, and this is when I, the first time I heard about it, in early December, I got an email from Nancy Riesenberg that, that with a, a blog describing uh, a bit of this process. And the most exciting part of this for me was that a part of the resolution of this case was the county attorney's office putting out a statement acknowledging historical harms and acknowledging that people had tried to do something about this statue by legal means and had been ignored. And so uh, for me, that was a thrill because it's an, actually an example of collective accountability I talk a lot about the importance of individual and collective accountability. What has to change in the community and the institutions so this doesn't happen again? What responsibility lies in the community and the institutions or the society for the harm that might have happened? And so in this case, they didn't just focus on individual accountability. It was a clear example of collective accountability, a statement by the institution acknowledging the historical harms that are a root of the, the behavior. Um, so we're breaking through in, in some interesting ways. I mean, it's a single case out of the thousands and thousands of cases, but but it gives us a model. This is what it can, this is what collective accountability can look like. But this is the result of 30 years of work. It's over 30 years since I first learned about restorative justice and started introducing that idea in Minnesota. And so, and, and Cheryl made reference too to the fact that these conversations have been going on for years and years. Uh, I think it's accelerating now because there's a lot more conversation about restorative justice than there had been. But around the pandemic, uh, very quickly for me, there were two things that, that said to me that this makes our work more important than ever. Uh, the, the first of those was that the pandemic so quickly tore back the curtain on inequities, right? Where was the burden fall, falling, right? People with more privilege could stay home and people with less privilege had to get on the bus or in the subway and go to work you know, in New York and be much more at risk. So it really, um, although it, it gave people privilege and experience of the lack of control in one's life, that's more common as an experience for people with less privilege, but, but they, the impact is hugely differential. And so I felt that it, it tore back the veil on, um, on the, the discrepancies in people's lives uh, around risk and around control and, and those kinds of things. And the school issue impacts so much greater on uh, people who are already oppressed that, that those children will suffer much more from not having been in person in school than the, the ones in middle-class families with uh, reasonable 
resources. Um, so that was one piece that, that our work is more important than ever because the discrepancies are clearer than, than ever. The other part that was, I think, so profound in the pandemic was how much we need each other relationally. Like that people suffered so much from not having the, the natural, informal, organic, relational interactions that they were, they were used to in, uh, in their lives. And that that's exactly what you know, our work is based in this idea that this part of us as human beings is so critical. And I felt that uh, the pandemic really highlighted that so that it, it meant our work was more important than ever. A, a grand issue of race and racism in this country from the very beginning of my work in restorative justice and, and especially circle, so circle in particular, I felt that the restorative framework and the circle as a concrete process were really the only way forward around issues of race. And, and, that, and I, that was in the 90s that, because the restorative framework really articulated what people who've been harmed need. And that from that framework, we could more clearly understand what's needed by people who've been harmed and oppressed. Um, for hundreds of years and it's around the idea of telling a story and being able to tell it over and over again, being heard, being heard, listened to and heard and, um, and being validated that what happened was wrong, right? Those things we know from the restorative justice work and they're very doable. There's some things we can't undo but there are things that are very doable and that we've learned how to do those in the restorative justice work. And so I've always thought that framework can really inform how we try to move forward um, around the issues of, of race and inequity. And then the, the circle process for me is just like the only space where I think that we can have really safe conversations with truth telling without white people getting completely overwhelmed by shame. Uh, and so that that process itself, I think without that, I don't know how, how we get um, to that place of dismantling the, the white supremacy. I think that it has to, and it, the, the connection, the human connection that's made through storytelling that allows us to transcend all of that other conditioning that we've had around some people are more valuable than, than, um, than other people. And so um, the, and I, wow. <laughs> We're in a place today around these conversations that I could not have imagined a year ago. Uh, and, and so uh, this holding this paradox, which is just stretching me constantly between the awfulness of what we've been living through and the ways in which that has moved us at a speed that I never dreamed of to uh, new levels of, of conversation and, and, and it feels a bit like, like whiplash in that process. So that'll pass to Dave. No, thank you, Kay and Cheryl. When you look at, at what's going on with the pandemic and I've had conversations for the last seven or eight months with people that are inconvenienced uh, by staying home, not being able to go to the movies or the restaurants or the bars. And they get really, really upset with people that make these decisions that are trying to save our lives. And they complain, I got I got to stay home, I can't do this, I can't do that. And I've reminded them a couple times, several of them, when you're feeling like you're inconvenienced because you have to stay home and can't go do the things you want to do, go home, log onto your computer and put in Vietnam prisoners of war. And you'll see a list of the date that they were captured, the date that they died, or the date that they released. And we're talking six or seven years. And they couldn't call Festival Foods and have groceries delivered. 
and you've only been at home for 35 days. These guys have been there for six or seven years. You have nothing to complain about. What we have to do is do like they did and put our shoulders and our heads and our minds together to defeat this thing as a community. It, it, we sometimes misunderstand community as thinking it's our little neighborhood or our little reservation or our little town. My aunt taught me the definition of community. When we can all laugh or cry over the same thing, that's community. When 9-11 happened, this country, actually the world became one community in a matter of seconds. We all cried. We had one big community and we could have done just fantastic things as a community, but we couldn't sustain it. We couldn't sustain that because pretty soon that I'm more important than you and it was your fault and all of this stuff comes out. And we, within two weeks, we're kind of back to where we were before. People would stop and listen to what Mother Earth is telling us about this pandemic. The people in India that could see the mountains for the first time in like 50 years, or the lack of smog in Los Angeles. And we all want to be in a big hurry to go back to normal. And it makes no sense to go back to smog, hazy skies, pollution. Our values have to change. Our priorities have to change and it has to change for everybody. As far as the Black Lives Matter, that movement goes, I read several books on, I think it's, his name is Brian Stevenson. And my takeaway, and I can't, I can't really explain it. I'm still trying to sort this out in my head. And he talks about truth and reconciliation. And the truth is that the descendants of the justice system are still trying the descendants of the oppressed. A lot of those judges are descendants of other judges from an era when slavery was still around and we, we we think because we teach the history of it that we're teaching the truth of it uh, and I don't think we're doing that I think we're teaching the history but we haven't gotten down to the truth and therefore we can't reconcile it I don't think we have to uh, make people angry uh, by bringing that up, but I think we have to acknowledge it. And I think Kay hit it on the head. A circle is a safe place for us to do this. A very safe place where we can talk about this and, and let's talk about it truthfully. And then we can reconcile. There's another book that I read. It's by the grandson of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the Gift of Anger. And I'm looking at uh, today's uh, activities and situation, and there's a lot of anger. I mean, there's a ton of anger. Let's channel that. Let's harness that anger because nothing really changes unless somebody gets angry. And we're angry. We just have to point that anger towards a good outcome. Maybe we can have a, a, a cleaner air, safer drinking water, safer streets. But let's take that anger and point it towards something with a positive outcome rather than the violence that we're seeing. I'm hopeful. 
tell you there were times last week when I wasn't so hopeful, but I'm hopeful again. And especially being part of this and knowing that uh, the Center for Court Innovation is not letting go of, of uh, this desire uh, to, to teach and to, to use restorative justice processes. I know that I've changed. And somebody asked me the other day, what do you teach people when you talk? And I says, hopefully nothing. <laughs> hopefully they question everything I say. You don't, don't just write down my, what I say and say that's the answer. No question my answers question the answers of every politician that says we need more prisons. Question the answers that we're getting from the people that lead us. Start questioning those. And say, to make them justify what they're saying. Do we need more prisons or do we need more healing? So hopefully The people that are listening here today to get a little change of heart and then they talk to somebody else who can change their heart the heart is where the purity of thought resides it's not in our mind we watch too much cnn and msnbc and and fox news and there's nothing going up on up here Okay, I'm going to invite some of those folks in right now, if that's good with you. Can I do that? Okay. And I have to tell you, I've done this twice now. Once was the uh, election in 2016, and one was last week. <clears throat> when it seemed like the whole world was falling apart. I went outside, stood on my deck at night, and I looked up at the sky. And every star, every planet, the moon was exactly where it belonged. Nothing upset the universe. I was the only one upset. The rest of it was still in perfect order, just as the creator wanted it. And I said, well, then this can't be so bad. So just keep that heart um, pure and uh, let's work on the mind a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um... I have the horrible job of being the, the timekeeper right now. So I feel really good that we got through two questions. I had four questions, but I feel like two is like miraculous for the four of us. Um, I just wanna share my, my two cents that I, I just wanna highlight what um, the, the piece about how this pandemic has revealed both the inequities. I just wanna push that one forward and and the fact that we are all connected and impacted by each other, like it or not. And Dave, thanks for those words about listening to others and, and to all of you. I wanna invite Erica and Carolyn and Ashley, um, three uh, practitioners, because if I was gonna say how this work impacted me, it is about, um, it's about the generations of people doing this. It's about all the people who came before us and all the people who are coming after us. And it's really, um, that is the most beautiful part of this work for me. Um, and so I'm inviting some um, great folks. Carolyn, are you ready to go first? What we're gonna do is have our practitioners ask a couple of questions um, of our panelists as, and we're gonna go through the Q&A and get to those next. So we only have a couple of minutes. Um, so everyone, we're gonna do some short and sweet questions and some short and sweet answers so that we can get to the questions of the panelists and have time for our closing. Thank you, Carolyn, go ahead. Hi everyone, um, my name is Carolyn Patances and I'm a program manager at the RISE Project. So we work to ensure community-based anti-violence efforts have more resources to prevent um, and respond to the intersection of intimate partner violence and gun violence while supporting people causing harm and transforming their lives for better. So my question is for Kay who has witnessed circle practice used to respond to intimate partner violence. And my question is, at what point can we make the determination that the person that caused harm is ready for an RJ process with the person they caused harm to? 
I would say that any place where you're serious about creating this kind of programming, you have to bring together all the stakeholders and collectively they figure out what, and you, you, and you, you do that by gathering information. You look at where these kinds of things are being done. What are the ways that people are deciding when it's appropriate to use, uh, particularly a face-to-face -face process? When is it not appropriate? Who needs to be a part of that process? Uh, how do you balance power in the, the process? And um, how do you make assessments as you're moving along about whether it's time yet? Uh, and so there is a program in Minnesota that has run for over 20 years uh, with face-to-face -face meetings in interpartment partner violence uh, situations and uh, very few cases, tiny project, very few cases. Um, and you know, so you would talk to people like them uh, to figure out what, how were they assessing. But they typically work with someone for at least six months before they actually do what they call the, the sentencing process, which is determining what, what accountability is going to, to look like. And then in their case, the sentences always include a continuation of the circle until all the requirements are fulfilled in whatever that agreement was. And so, so mostly, it's a process of those people most involved and who are knowledgeable over time about these issues coming together to figure out, okay, what do we know? And how would, how would we assess that? And how do we make sure we keep communication moving constantly and that we have ways that the voice of the victim is coming in, not just directly in the face-to-face -face process, but the voice of the victim can be coming in in multiple ways and people are checking in with the victim because that may be the person who knows most about the, the readiness of the person who caused harm. It's a big question for a <laughs> short answer, let me say. <laughs> I'm very impressed, Kay. <laughs> okay, one, more, one more thing I wanna say about this whole issue of IPD. There is a, a statement called Moment of Truth that was put out in June, I believe, by and signed by 28 co state coalitions uh, for domestic violence or for uh, sexual assault that acknowledges that the, the movement around domestic violence and interpersonal violence and sexual assault has contributed to mass incarceration. It is one of the most powerful statements of accountability I've ever seen by uh, a group of, of people who have worked together for years with good intentions, but recognizing now that, that the way they approached it with more law enforcement and harsher sentences has actually undermined the very principles that they intended to be promoting in their work. Um, that for me is an incredible breakthrough in, in this work and I just want people to know about it. Thanks, Kay. I will definitely take that into my work moving on. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Erica, you want to go next? Um, hi, I am Erica Wright. I'm currently a lead facilitator with the Manhattan Justice Opportunities, um, where I provide RJ diversion opportunities to reduce the use of incarceration. And prior to that, I worked for three years on the Restorative Justice in Schools Project Implementing Restorative Practices in Brooklyn High Schools. My question is for Cheryl. Um, from the beginning of me starting to do RJ work, one of the questions that I've always wondered is that in our communities, who from the inception have always been oppressed, how do you restore something that we've never had? If, how do you restore in a community that's never been whole to begin with? I don't look at it as going backwards. A lot of people think about restoration is how do we go back and fix something. I look at it as moving forward and I look at restoration as a forward moving forward thinking kind of thing. Because there's not a lot sometimes that we can draw from the past that's helpful in terms of the principles and practices we want to engage in. Um, and I think about just very specifically just even in terms of schools right RJ was generally attached to discipline. So they, it was only about how do we address those issues where we believe that harm has been caused, as opposed to using the whole breadth of restorative justice, which is about fundamentally relationship building and seeing each other, right? And I think about a school in Denver, and I'll be quick, where 
the, the social worker would stand on the steps of the school every single morning and he would greet every single student by name. By the end of the first month, he knew everybody's name. And so what he was doing was greeting them and acknowledging them, but also taking a look and to see if everything was okay or how were they doing. If it looked like they may not be doing so well, he didn't send them to class. There, was a, there were parents and other people who were set up in the, the lunchroom and they had you know, food and things and they were trained they, in, in, pra in the practices to sit and just talk to them. How you doing? What's going on? Anything you need? And so to me, restorative justice can't just be about circles like and, and, and trying to address harm or repair harm. And, I mean, clearly we can do, I mean, obviously the circles, we need to be doing more relationship building and healing and all that. But it's also about accompaniment, right? It's about how do we just show up for each other, with each other every single day. And I think if we, and so for me, I, because I try to make the word work and very often it doesn't work if I'm thinking I'm restoring something from the past and I just sort of have redefined it, you know? And, and now it's really about how do I look at what, what people need, listen to what their, their needs are, really thinking about what they're saying about, you know, what's necessary and what they're working on and what the, and they're struggling with and how do we address that? Um, as Kwame Nkrumah said, forward ever, backward never. So. All right. Um, I think we're going to just move on to um, a question of, from the audience. Um, I think we're just really out of time, so we're going to keep this really short. Um, thanks for those great questions. So this is a, just a question for um, you know the panel. If you can give people a, a concrete example of how this works. Maybe this is a question best for you, Kay. You wanna give an example of a, of a concrete way that this works for you. Just walk people through real quick how, how that looks like in terms of addressing harm. Will you be able to give people a little bit of a, a one by one of how you imagine a harm circle working um, so that they can imagine it for whatever harm, if it's intimate partner violence or sexual assault or um, school violence or neighbors, how, how can they imagine what it looks like to address that harm? Okay, so I'll do the best I can, but, but I, I'm not sure if <laughs> it's adequate to the question. Um, but I'll talk about how I think about that. That if you have a situation of some kind of harm and you've decided that, that you think a circle process would be a way to, to heal, for people to move forward toward healing, and everyone needs to heal. Because when we cause harm to others, we harm our own soul. And the way that we heal our own soul is to take responsibility and take action to repair the harm. And that's how we define accountability. So it's through accountability that we heal if we've caused harm. It's through someone else listening to us, validating us, and acknowledge they cause us harm that can help the person who was hurt heal. And so the goal of the process overall is healing. But that you can't jump right to talking about that. You don't jump into the circle and say, okay, we need to talk about this harm. Because unless you feel like you have some common ground, it's very hard to hear the other person. We have too much anger, we have too much shame that comes up in these situations. And so you have to be careful about timing. Uh, you may do some individual work with people separately. You might have someone who was hurt and someone who caused harm in separate circles initially for them to get comfortable with the process, for them to begin to do the self exploration about how, how were they impacted or for the person who caused harm, what was going on that produced this behavior. And when you bring people together, you're gonna to talk about values. You're gonna talk about what is it, what are the shared values that we can stand on as we have this really uncomfortable and difficult conversation. And you're gonna share some stories, typically about hard places in life, not this situation, but some, some stories that, that get at the fact that all of us struggle and that all of us have hard places in life. And, and when we share some stories, we see each other differently. It changes the lens that we have for what other people say. So you have to do that work of finding the humanity in each other and grounding in some shared values and then you talk about what happened and, and uh, how was everybody impacted and what's been the hardest thing about this situation and 
what could we do now that that repairs the harm and that makes change required so that it doesn't happen again and it's not just about the individual who caused the harm but what has to change in the community so it doesn't happen again what has to change in the institution that this might have been in the context of so that it doesn't happen again um, and then you have to be prepared and so you come up with a plan everybody has great ideas you come to consensus about some plan that will that will address repairing the harm to the degree possible that acknowledges the pain and harm experienced by people and that takes steps to prevent it from happening again you go forward with the plan and you have to be prepared for the fact that some aspects of this plan may not work not because will people are willfully difficult but because life unfolds differently than you anticipated and, and so you have to keep coming back and, and checking in and how is the plan working and what's not working, we have to problem solve around it. And it's very much a problem solving approach tapping into the wisdom of the collective and no one individual has to know the answer by themselves for next step or for an overall vision um, that we can allow this to emerge from the process itself. Does that help? I think so. I think people have questions around um, the big A word, you know, the accountability word. Are we holding people accountable? There's that question that's always going to come up. Um, there's questions I see about how are we, um, how are we managing this with the coercive institutions that surround us, and how do we have the right interplay um, between the different messages that people get. Um, People are writing questions around, um, you know, the, I think that a question around uh, how do we um, can, how do we do more than just give a statement? I think there's questions around, is there an apology, an apology expected? Can we do this? There's so many questions. Can we do this um, only on a voluntary basis? And what does that require? There's, there's tons of questions um, that we all have. Uh, and so we're gonna try to follow up with some of them by email, um, but these are, you know, ultimately negotiations that everyone is going to have to make with themselves and in their community and with the people around them about, you know, how do you set that um, norm around what, what does accountability really, really mean? Are we asking one person to be accountable or are we all, um, are we all accountable for our portion of it? And I think that restorative justice is asking us to be accountable to our piece of it, both historically and in the present tense. What is your role in this? And I think that we're trying to lessen people's defense mechanisms by showing and modeling accountability and listening and being like, okay, well, I did this piece, what piece did you do? Um, and it's just really different from our regular approaches uh, in which one person takes all the accountability and everybody else just pretends like they weren't part of it. Um, and that they never came to it. And so that's just a, a whole other piece that I think everyone on this call, and thank you all for being here, um, is gonna have to make those determinations with your community. And I think as Dave said, with the broader sense of your community, but also just the people there who are most impacted, have those conversations. What does accountability look like for us? Who is actually taking accountability? Um, how can we all take a little bit more so that we relieve the burden of the one who's being asked to take accountability? Um, these are all questions that will come up in your circles and in your discussions, um, but you can only kind of have those conversations, including about race and oppression, when you make the space for them. Um, so that was some of what we wanted to make the space for here today, to raise the questions, raise the hurt, raise the pain, raise the excitement and the ideas, and hopefully you can um, take them back into your community and have the questions and, and do the work, as Kay said, the 30 years, as Dave said, like do the work to have these difficult conversations. Um, so we're gonna close. We will, we will be back with you by email. Um, I'm so grateful to Cheryl, Dave, and Kay. I am incredibly grateful to Ray Deal for um, setting us forward in a good way. Um, and I'm very grateful to Erica Wright and I will pass the mic to her for closing us here today. So thank you so, so much, everybody. Erica Wright, I see you. <laughs> okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay. Um, I am going to be performing a poem called Mermaids. Mermaids. Okay. 
Sometimes we learn to survive with our heads beneath the water. We stop struggling to reach the surface and learn to fill our lungs so that we can swim with no air force, much more comfortable surviving the deep blue and black depths when you were born there, while the anchors attached to our toes, ankles, shins, knees, thighs, and waist guarantees that our weight is never light enough to reach the surface. So we give birth to little mermaids whose feet were not made to dance on soiled ground and whose smiles are peninsula between oceans away from their eyes. But you should see these mermaids dance with scale fins for skin to protect them from the outside in because we teach our young kin that to survive means you must have thick skin. But still, they dance a lover's tune to a frequency beat out of them. Resiliency means you tap into survivors' DNA and let nature select when you will project your ancestors' will to do more than survive, but to thrive. Even if only in a dance where you don't remember learning the moves, these mermaids are connecting to ancestral roots, but still they are living descendants of those who fear the consequences of the truth that this world would try to kill everything made of joy within you. So often families do it first, thinking love means if I break your joy before the world does, when they come, they can't find it so it doesn't hurt, but even after the world has come and gone, and while all alone, these mermaids couldn't find their joy either, surviving underwater and drowning off ether from never being light enough to reach the surface, or never feeling the light of the sun whose warmth could transform scaled fins into skin, soft enough to be felt by a loved one's calloused hands, but still, their ancestors gave them joy in a dance to a tune with a frequency too low to hear, but everywhere and in everything they could feel like air, bodies wound, for they knew in collective movement hearts beat abound. And where hearts beat abound, love is found, but it is in the slowing down that we tell them our love knows none of the boundaries they felt for centuries, feeding lies to these mermaids trying to break free because your scared love doesn't see how it's continuing to bind their minds back to a time where their ancestors could not congregate in groups of three, not even for dance not knowing that the emancipated body doesn't always include the mind. So at times, families inadvertently pick the tree from which their noose will be the only thing on a dancing body to swing free. So swing low, little mermaid, as our sweet chariot floats away because no one is coming to save us. So we must cut the strings of the ancestral anchors loose and get lost in our underwater dance so that we may rise again, not needing feet or scaled skin because we sail with the wind and everywhere we are home amongst those who have gone before us and we are protected. Thank you. I think we should, you know, unmute and clap that, I, you know, at, where are my panelists? We unmute and clap. Thank you all. Snap, snap, Incredible. <laughs> snap, 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 snap it all. Thank you, Erica. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica.